This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are super important, and you can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. Now, just before we get started with this one, I thought the cleanup of the Bhopal disaster would be an interesting mega project that was a vast disaster. And I thought, oh, you know, the cleanup operation behind that's going to be huge. Ollie, the writer on this channel, wrote me an email and was like, Simon, um, it, it kind of wasn't. They just didn't really bother doing a very good job. And uh, so I was kind of thinking, should I do this video or shouldn't I? But I think it's an important story to tell anyway. So I gave Ollie the green lights and here we have it. I really hope you enjoy it anyway. We think of mega projects as glorious achievements. Even when they don't quite work out in the end, we can still point to the perseverance, vision, and ambition of humanity. Poet Lem Sisse once said, reach for the top of the tree and you get the first branch, but reach for the stars and you get to the top of the tree. But there are some mega projects born out of disaster. They become less about glory and more about desperate survival. And you need no better example of this than the Bhopal disaster. What happens in the town of Bhopal, located in the town of Madhya Pradesh, remains the world's worst industrial disaster. The numbers involved are truly shocking, almost unbelievable. An official death toll of 5,295 is widely regarded as incorrect, with some claiming it may have reached 16,000 in the immediate aftermath. Amnesty International has said that as many as 25,000 people may have died from the immediate effects and also the long-term damage. This is a tragedy that went well beyond the 2nd and 3rd of December 1984, a tale of callous disregard for safety and corruption that reached the highest levels. Even to this day, the events of what really happened in the Bhopal gas plant are furiously debated. The Union Carbide India Limited UCIL, pesticide plant in Bhopal first opened in 1969. During the first 10 years, it primarily produced the pesticide 7, the brand name for carbaryl. In 1979, a methyl isocyanate MIC production plant was added. This extremely hazardous compound was also used to create pesticide, as well as being used in rubber and adhesives. As technology progressed in the early 1980s and the demand for the pesticide began to fall, companies began using MIC less and less, despite the additional cost of producing MIC-free material. However, in Bhopal, as well as many other factories, production remained high, leading to large volumes of the dangerous substance being stored on site. But the most shocking thing in the build-up to the Bhopal disaster was that many people had seen it coming. Unions had already complained about the conditions their workers were operating in, as well as concerns about the plant itself. In 1981, a worker died after removing his gas mask in a panic and inhaling toxic phosgene gas. A local journalist, Reg Kumar Kaswani, pens a piece for Bhopal's local paper, Rap Hat, with the powerful words, Wake up, people of Bhopal, you are on the edge of a volcano. Problems at the plant continued. A leak in January 1982 affected 24 workers, none of whom had been instructed to wear protective equipment. A month later, another 18 people were affected. I could go on and list every leak that occurred between 1982 and 1984, but I won't. Let me just tell you that it happens with shocking regularity. The Bhopal gas plant was a disaster just waiting to happen, and many people knew it. But as the residents of the town prepared for bed on the night of December 2, 1984, few would have ever imagined the horror that was about to unfold. While the tragedy may have officially begun on the 2nd of December, its causes can be traced back to a MIC storage tank known as E610 months before the disaster. Tank E610 had effectively lost its ability to contain its nitrogen gas pressure, meaning that the MIC inside could not be pumped out. To make matters worse, the tank had been holding more MIC that had been stated in safety guidelines, holding around 42 tons rather than the regulation 30 tons. This led to the plant briefly being shut down for a safety inspection, but it reopened in late November. A final attempt to pump out the toxic compound failed on December 1st. At the time of the disaster, the control and safety systems in the Bhopal gas plants were far from ideal. Many of the gauges didn't work properly, while valves and lines were in poor condition. Several vent gas scrubbers, pollution control devices designed to remove some particles and gases from exhaust streams, were not in operation. Add into that a refrigeration system that had been removed two years earlier, and a flare tower, which in theory would have burnt some of the escaping MIC, but it was the wrong size for the tank. This was all a perfect storm for catastrophe. 
In the early evening on December 2, water somehow entered tank E610 through a side pipe. The debate about how the water got there is a pretty complex one, and we're going to get into that a little later in the video. Anyway, the water mixing with the MIC in tank E610 resulted in a runaway exothermic reaction, a chemical reaction where energy is released through light and heat. This was significantly sped up with the help of high ambient temperatures and iron found in the corroding pipes. The pressure in tank E610 began to rise. 2 psi 10.30 p.m. 10 psi 11 p.m. Those in the control room assumed the readings were just a mistake, and they initially ignored them, and it wasn't until 11.30 p.m. that the effects of the MIC leak could be felt within the factory. Staff on site they began looking for a leak, and at 11.45 p.m. one was found. And it's here that we now come to what may go down as the most unfortunately timed tea break in the history of mankind. Not realizing the full extent of what was unfolding, the decision was made to address the problem after a tea break, which began at 12.15 a.m. In light of the multiple leaks that had occurred in the years before, it's perhaps unsurprising that such a relaxed attitude was taken, but still, this was going to prove to be a tragic mistake. The tea break ended at 12.40 a.m., and five minutes later, tank E610 hit a PSI of 40 and then 50 as temperatures hit 25 degrees Celsius. The tipping point it had come and gone. The world's worst industrial accident was already in full flow. In fact, MIC had already begun to seep out of the factory. 30 tons would disappear within the first hour, with an additional 10 tons over the following 60 minutes. At 12.50 a.m., employees within the plant sounded the alarm for the first time. There were, in fact, two alarms, one within the plant and another mounted outside that could be heard for miles around. In another heartbreaking decision, the alarm that was meant to alert the hundreds of thousands who lived nearby was turned off. As employees began evacuating upwind, the residents of Bhopal had no idea that a silent killer was drifting towards them. Confusion reigned as even the police did not yet know what was happening. Frantic phone calls to the station were greeted with calm reassurances that everything was just fine. As people began arriving at the local hospital, medical personnel first believed it to be a case of ammonia or phosgene poisoning. Even when they were finally informed that there had been a massive MIC leak at the plant, few even knew what it was or how to treat it. The gas leak finally ended around 2 a.m., at which time the outdoor public alarm was sounded for a sustained period for the first time. But it was far too late. Now, just before we get into the terrible impact that is this video, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for making this video possible. Now, if you use the internet, if you've got personal information, and let's face it, we all do these days, well, you should be protecting it online. And, you know, the internet's a weird place. There's people out there who just want to ruin your day. They want to take your details, steal your identity, which can be a real pain in the ass. But fortunately, Surfshark, today's sponsor, has something called Hacklock. This searches database for your passwords, which I know it sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. Surfshark are the good guys. They let you know if someone's stolen your password, you can change it, and then you're back to safety. Also, it's not just about safety and security, it's also about entertainment. Let's say that you've got a Netflix account and you're like, oh, but I really want to see what's up on UK Netflix. Well, with Surfshark, you just pop that VPN over to a UK server and boom, UK Netflix, just like that. It can also do other things like uh, if you've been browsing for flights, I mean, not right now, but if you're browsing for flights online, let's say, and then you get a really high price, flip on the VPN, go somewhere else, you know, virtually, and you go back to their website, you might just find that the prices are lower because you're not being retargeted anymore. Surfshark's also totally unlimited, so if you want to go download movies in raw 8K, I mean, if you've got an 8K TV, I guess, well, you can do that. Also, 30 days money back guarantee if you don't like it. You can get 83% off three months for free through the link in the description below. And let's get back to it. What happened through the night is really quite hard to imagine. Thousands had died by morning, many suffering under the most horrific of circumstances. The MIC had caused choking, reflexogenic circulatory collapse, and pulmonary edema. In another tragic twist, MIC is twice as heavy as air, so those close to the ground were more susceptible. An estimated 200,000 children were exposed to the gas. 
The immediate aftermath it appeared to be a war zone. Medical facilities were completely overwhelmed, with over 170,000 people requiring attention. As much as 70% of the doctors operating in the area have since been classified as underqualified for such a situation. Within days, trees were dead, while the remains of 10,000 animals had to be quickly disposed of over fears of disease. The final death toll is still, as we mentioned at the beginning, hugely debated, and the numbers vary from source to source. Now, that official count is 5,295, and that's only slightly higher than the 5,000 widows' pensions that have been handed out by the Indian government. The numbers just don't add up. The truth is that it seems nobody is quite sure of how many people died in Bhopal. Amnesty International has stated that 7,000 died in the immediate aftermath, and as many as 25,000 have died as a result of the accident. It's currently thought that roughly half a million people have been affected by the accident with respiratory problems, eye irritation, or blindness, and reproductive health issues, as well as an ongoing catalogue of complications. Legal actions began as early as 1985. Union Carbide India Limited (UCIL), who owned the plants, were themselves majority owned by Union Carbide Corporation (UCC), and it was UCC who received the blame for the accident. As you can imagine, for a giant American gas corporation, and maybe I'm being a little harsh here, but not really, while well, their behavior during the entire process wasn't noble. Their offer of a short-term relief fund of $5 million on April 19, 1985 was unsurprisingly refused out of hand. In May, the US justice system effectively washed their hands of the case by transferring it to the Indian courts and stating that UCIL was owned and operated solely by Indians. UCC eventually offered $350 million, which again the Indian government rejected outright, stating that the required settlement should be in the region of $3.3 billion. In February 1989, the two sides agreed to $470 million. This equated to a payment to each gas-exposed individual of 25,000 Indian rupees, which is around $2,200 in 1989, or $4,500 today. While the events of the 2nd and 3rd of December appear to be fairly cut and dry, there's a huge disagreement over who is to blame. The Indian government and the local people place the responsibility of the accident squarely at the feet of UCC. They claim that the accident occurred as a result of years of underinvestment and negligence. The hopeless safety record of the Bhopal plants would seem to support this argument. On the other hand, UCC has fought ferociously, saying that the accident was the result of sabotage by a single disgruntled employee who waited until the shift change at 10 45 p.m. before attaching a water hose to the tank. In 2017, S.P. Chowdhury, former MIC production manager, even went as far to name the man who he suspected. Lawyers for UCC have long argued that the Indian government was implicit in the cover-up, an accusation the government vehemently denies. Dow Chemical Company, who now owns what was UCC, still operates a memorial website arguing for this theory. From a neutral point of view, it's easy to side against UCC and the Dow Chemical Company here. As I said earlier, it's kind of difficult to believe large international gas companies with appalling safety records, but for the sake of impartiality and fairness, there does seem to be evidence to support both sides. The accusation that the logbooks were manipulated after the accident is a particularly uncomfortable fact for those who rail blindly against big business. On the other hand, considering what we know about these kind of companies, well, we're not going to put anything past them. Perhaps the most shocking and lasting effects of this entire disaster has been the environmental cleanup, or should I say the shocking lack of it? Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is sort of the most shocking thing. When I proposed this video to Ollie, I was like, surely there was a massive cleanup. Let's see. The factory was closed in 1986, and most of the tanks and equipment were sold, but the wreckage of the plant remains, along with its poisonous legacy. But this is a terrible legacy that started even before the 1984 accident. As early as 1982, the water wells in the area had to be abandoned over safety concerns, and in 1989, UCC's own study found that the water in and around the factory area was toxic. You can take your pick from any number of toxic substances that were found in the contaminated water. And these substances weren't found in small amounts. A drinking sample taken from the site was 500 times the acceptable contamination level set by the WHO. So, why has there been no outrage? Why has there been no campaigning Erin Brockovich figure? Well, numerous reasons. Firstly, some make the absurd claim that these chemicals are not dangerous. And 
we're absolutely serious here. Then there's the complex issue of who's responsible. The buck has been passed so many times on the Bhopal disaster that it's difficult to keep track. UCC sold their stake in UCIL in 1994 to EverReady Industries India Limited EIIL, who led some sort of cleanup operation until 1998 when the land was turned over to the local Madhya Pradesh government. Just to complicate things further, UCC was sold to Dow Chemical Company in 2001. We see a long progression of several companies and government organizations who have managed to botch the entire clean operation. But it must be said that this is not a simple operation. Greenpeace estimates that it would cost over $30 million over four years to completely clean the area. This is not a small amount, but considering that Dow DuPont, the company that resulted in the merger between Dow Chemical Company and DuPont, made $62 billion in 2017, they could probably cover it. But there is the debate of what to do with the 350 tons of waste that is thought to be in the area. In 2012, it appeared that the German government had agreed to take the waste and dispose of it, but a huge public outcry I quickly saw them backtrack. The result of all this acrimonious debate is that Bhopal remains deeply polluted, but rather strangely has managed to claim India's cleanest city award three years in a row. Today over two million people call the city home. Many who lived in Bhopal at the time of the disaster have since left, and you can understand why. The Bhopal disaster appears to be something that the Indian government would rather just move on from. The inclination for such a large-scale cleanup operation is just not there. But sadly, the shadow that this vast wreckage of a gas plant throws over the land on a baking Indian evening stretches much, much further than what we can see. The agony of the 2nd and 3rd of December 1984 still stalks its victims, and it's unclear whether Bhopal will ever really be able to fully move on. Now, I'm not going to ask like I normally do if you enjoyed this video, but, and I, I, and I also know this is a little bit different from a Mega Projects video, and I already explained why, but I did feel it was important to cover. If you don't like it, well, there's a thumbs down button below, but I hope you don't press it. If you did like the video, please do click like, do subscribe, I will get back to Mega Projects shortly, and thank you for watching.